Okay, hi, so welcome to this video on exchange surfaces. So in this video, we're gonna discuss what actually makes a good exchange surface. And we're also gonna go through two examples uh, that you'll see in nature. So first of all, what is an exchange surface? Well, an exchange surface is basically a barrier across which uh, things are transferred, right? Or exchanged, hence the name. So for example, um, if uh, we need oxygen in our cells, there's an exchange surface which allows oxygen to get into our cells. If we need to take in glucose, right? That needs to be exchanged because glucose needs to get into our cells from the blood, etc., etc. right? So that gives you a hint as to what an exchange surface is. So what makes up a good exchange surface? Well, the first and most obvious answer is what we call the surface area to volume ratio, right? That's surface area area to volume, that was spelled wrong, volume ratio, right? Sometimes you'll see it just written as S A to V, right? That means the same thing. Basically what we're saying is what is the surface area in comparison to the volume, okay? For an exchange surface to be really good, you want a very, very high surface area in comparison to its volume. And I'll go through what that actually means. So the easiest way and the best way to look at it is by thinking of a simple cube, right? So if I was to draw a cube, this won't be perfect. It's probably gonna be more like a cuboid, but let's pretend that this is a perfect cube, right? Like so in 3D. Now, we can calculate both the surface area and the volume of this cube. Let's say that each side is one centimeter in length, right? Well, the surface area, okay, the way we calculate that is each side has the same area and there are six of them, okay? And so each side is one times one, which equals one centimeter squared. And we have six of them. So we have six times one equals six uh, centimeter squared in total, right? So six faces times one centimeter squared for each face. So the surface area there is six centimeters squared. What about the volume? Well, the volume is calculated by length times width times depth, right? And that is gonna be equal in this case to one times one times one, which is gonna give us one centimeter cubed, right? And so the surface area to volume ratio is basically six to one, okay? Six to one, sometimes you'll see that as just, uh, just written as six, where it's the surface area divided by the volume, right? But the surface area to volume ratio there is six to one. Now what happens when that cube gets larger? Let's say for example, we use a cube that is bigger. This is not gonna be to scale in comparison to the other one, but I'm drawing it bigger. So you'll just have to live with it. And this is just awful. But there you go, get the picture. And let's say that each side in this case is five centimeters, right? First of all, what's the surface area? Right, well the surface area is equal to six lots of the faces, right? And that is five times five is the area of a face and that is equal to 25 centimeters squared. Okay, and if we have six faces, we have six times by that area, it's going to give us 150 centimeters squared. All right, now what about the volume? Well, the volume is equal to length times width times depth, which is five times five times five. And that is gonna be 25 times five or 125 centimeters cubed. And so the surface area to volume ratio is equal to what? Well, it's equal to 150 to 125, right? And that rounds down to six to five if you were to divide each side by 25, right? So this is the surface area to volume ratio. Now. If we have a look back up here, we have a six to one surface area to volume ratio versus a six to five surface area to volume ratio. So the smaller cube has by far a greater surface area in comparison to its volume, right? But that's by five times in fact, a six to one versus six to five. What does that mean? Well, the smaller cube is going to be a better, um, it's going to have better capability as an exchange surface, right? As things get bigger, then the surface area to volume ratio in general, if the shape is the same, is going to go down, right? And why is that important? Because the same can be said for 
organisms, right? If you have a really small organism versus a really large organism, let's say a single celled bacteria versus an elephant, right? The surface area to volume ratio of the single celled bacteria is going to be a crazy amount higher than it is for the elephant. Therefore, the bacteria does not need uh, something that we call a transport system in order to exchange substances with the environment, whereas the elephant certainly does, right? Things don't just move in and out of the elephant by diffusion, right? It's got a respiratory system, it's got a circulatory system. So we're talking about the lungs, we're talking about the heart, we're talking about blood vessels. Whereas a small single cell bacteria does not have any of those things because diffusion is fast enough for it to happen, right? The exchange surface um, on the bacteria is way more efficient because of that property. So in summary of that, as a result, a single celled organism does not need specialized exchange surfaces. It's um, its outer membrane is the is all the exchange surface it needs in order for um, in order for it to gain things from the environment and give things back to the environment, right? Whereas a larger organism needs specialized exchange surfaces, which we're going to come on to in a little bit, in order um, to take in and give out things to the environment, right? The outer, so the outer layer, if you like, of the organism is not enough based on the surface area to volume ratio. All right, so what else is gonna make these exchange surfaces effective? Okay, something that's really important is a thin layer or a thin membrane, right? Well, why is that important in an exchange surface? Well, this shortens the diffusion distance for substances traveling across, right? For example, if you had a membrane which was multiple cells thick, then substances traveling across that membrane have to travel through those cells, which actually takes up time and reduces the speed of that transfer. Whereas if you have a really thin membrane, then things can travel across it much quicker and that makes it a more efficient exchange surface. Okay, and what else? Well, they also need a good supply of um, substances, right? And I say substances because it's a broad term. So whatever is going to be exchanged needs to be in constant supply because if there isn't, then what happens is you don't maintain a concentration gradient. Okay, so it needs a good supply of substances. An example of that is, for example, our, um, our blood. Okay, our blood vessels coming into contact with other cells. Our blood vessels need to supply other cells with nutrients, for example, oxygen and um, glucose, etc. And if the blood didn't move around the body, right, then once uh, substances have diffused across into the cell, that would basically be it. There would be no more net transfer of the glucose or the oxygen. However, the fact that our blood continually circulates and replenishes what is inside it, then the cells are constantly supplied with more and more of the substance, and so that maintains the concentration gradient okay so it maintains concentration gradient for transfer all right okay so let's have a look at a couple of examples of this in action the first is in the lungs so let's say humans as an example we have lungs in order to transfer oxygen and carbon dioxide with the atmosphere all right, so let's have a look at a badly drawn diagram of an alveoli, okay, or an alveolus singular. Okay, so this here is the alveolus. Okay, these are tiny little sacs which are found inside your lungs, right? There are millions of these in your lungs. Okay, and this here is a blood vessel, right? Blood vessel, and in particular, it's a capillary. Okay, so I'll just write that here. Okay, now both of these things are one cell thick, right? So the the um, the black lines and the red lines there, they are one cell thick. Okay, why is that important? Remember we said that a short um, or a thin membrane or barrier makes diffusion happen faster. And so the fact that you have only one cell thick on each side means that things can diffuse in and out very quickly, right? And so from the alveoli, okay, this is where the oxygen goes, okay, it goes down here, because you breathe in, and you take in gases, and oxygen fills up these alveoli, right, oxygen then basically diffuses across that membrane into the blood, 
okay? Because the blood, let's say the blood is flowing this way. Here, the blood is deoxygenated, right? And I'm just gonna color that blue because you know that blood when it's blue, um, or sorry, blood with no oxygen is blue or bluey purple, okay? When it takes oxygen, it becomes oxygenated. And so the blood, which carries on this way, um, is red, okay? That's just showing you the direction that it's traveling. Also, the blood that's coming in, okay, I'll go back to blue, the blood that's coming in is full of CO2, right? And so CO2 from that blood goes into the alveoli, right? And both of these things are obviously happening down a concentration gradient. The blue blood doesn't really have any oxygen, and the alveoli is full of oxygen. And so oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the blood. On the other hand, the deoxygenated blood, the blue blood, is full of carbon dioxide because the waste product of respiration is carbon dioxide. We want to get rid of that because we don't want to keep it. And that is um, that is what happens in the blood, right? It travels in the blood, gets back to the lungs, and then it is shipped out, okay? And so this is traveling down its concentration gradient from the blood vessels to the alveoli. And then when we breathe out, then the CO2 basically leaves, right? And so that's what happens. You've got... Um, a short diffusion distance based on the one cell um, thick membranes on both the capillaries and on the alveoli. Now you'll notice this um, uh, this shape of the alveoli, right? It's not; it doesn't have flat walls. It, it's got folds all over it. There's a very good reason for that. That greatly increases the surface area, and so it has a very high surface area to volume ratio, and that also improves. Um, the efficiency and the speed of diffusion, which is great. Lastly, as we mentioned before, there is a great supply of substances, okay? We have a good supply of oxygen coming in, okay? Because we keep breathing in, and so we've got more oxygen coming in. And also, we have a constant supply via the circulatory system of carbon dioxide, right? Because the blood is constantly being pumped around, and it's bringing more and more carbon dioxide, maintaining that a concentration gradient as well. So you have a concentration gradient maintained, you have a short diffusion distance, and you have a high surface area, which means that this is a very efficient exchange surface. All right, and lastly, we're gonna have a look at part of the small intestine, right? Because your small intestines are also adapted for um, exchange of substances, right? We want to get products of digestion into our blood from the small intestine, right? We wanna absorb um, things from our food, and the small intestine is adapted to do that. Okay, so this is a diagram. Obviously, my drawing would have been terrible for this, so I've taken a diagram. Basically, what we have is we have these things here, so these projections, okay, they're called villi, right? Singular is a villus. And this greatly increases the surface area in order for exchange of substances. You'll notice that there are these curly things which are in red and blue, and obviously they are capillaries, okay? They are blood vessels, they are capillaries, and you so you have a good blood supply, right? Just like you did with the lungs. And so the high surface area and the good blood supply means that you are able to maintain um, a concentration gradient of substances, and also obviously the higher surface area means faster diffusion. Lastly, um, the Membranes are really thin, just like they were in the alveoli. Okay, you have a one cell thick membrane, which is bordering from the, let's use different color, from part of the small intestine to the capillaries, right? Both of those, uh, you can't really zoom in in this diagram, but if you think, if you had a capillary, that looked like so, what's bordering that are basically cells in the small intestine, okay? They're one cell thick, and obviously that means you can have exchange of substances in and exchange of substances out very quickly because there's a short diffusion pathway. Okay, and that will about do it for this video. I'm going to cover a couple more examples in another video of exchange services, but I hope that has made sense. If not, then do feel free to post a comment in the box below or send me a direct email but as usual please like and subscribe because it does help me out and it obviously will update you when more videos become available but i look forward to seeing you in the next one